Hello and welcome to our IVF webinar. Uh, please let me know that you can hear me because I do think that you didn't for a minute, but I hope all is okay now. Uh, Professor Nardo, can you hear me loud and clear? Yeah, absolutely fine. Very clear. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. It is our next webinar with you. I'm very happy to have you back with us as we have another important topic to discuss today. And as always, we will start off with your presentation. And after that, it will be time <clears throat> for your questions. And well, uh, just let me remind everyone that all those events are brought to you simply so that you can learn, so that you can find out a bit more on various topics on IVF, uh, as you are not able to proceed with the treatments, good news is that uh, slowly every clinic is starting to um, starting to offer their treatments and you will be able, <clears throat> hopefully, to start as well very, very soon. We are definitely hoping uh, for that and fingers crossed it will be possible quite soon. And as always, I just want to mention that uh, those events have been brought to you thanks to our ambassadors and partners. You can see them right here. So as always, Huge thanks for their support as well. And tonight, as you can already see, we have another special guest, guest Professor Luciano Nardo from, um, from uh, he is the founder and clinical director at Reproductive Health Group located in the UK. I'm very happy to have you back with us. How are you feeling tonight? Very good, very good. Thank you very much indeed for having me again. Happy to have you back for sure. And well, this is a topic that you will discuss, uterine factors that impact on blastocyst implantation. So of course, um, Dr. Prof Professor Nardo will start with his presentation. Uh, that will take approximately 30 minutes. And after that, it will be time for your questions. So remember that you can ask anything that you have in mind and you can put those questions in the chat section and right after that uh, professor nardo will answer so go ahead and do it you can do it now or later on uh, and uh, just feel free to to ask anything that you would like to ask and that is it from me at this point professor nardo are you ready to begin with your presentation sure sure thank excellent you. thank you Okay, thank you very much indeed, Caroline, and uh, um, welcome everyone and good evening. And um, I would like to thank my IVF answers for um, inviting me again to present on uh, another topic. Um, it is uh, always a great pleasure to be joined by so many of you. Um, and uh, uterine factors is uh, another important topic. And we know that uh, implantation is not just dependent on how good the embryo is, but also on uh, a normal um, uterine environment. So the topic tonight has been uh, um, brought to you with, uh, I think, with the plan to highlight some of the important issues that may affect the ability of a, of a blastocyst implanting. Um, and uh, I will be showing you some photographs and I'll try to make the presentation as clear and uh, um, perhaps descriptive as possible. So all of you, or I sincerely hope uh, the majority of you otherwise, will have uh, an understanding of what factors may impact on the ability of a blastocyst implanting and resulting in a successful pregnancy. Before I um, begin, I'd just like to um, make a, a, a comparison between uh, um, uh, implantation failure and miscarriage. Um, when we look at the um, ability of an embryo to implant or the ability of an implanted embryo to continue um, uh, throughout the early stages of pregnancy, there might be some um, factors that could be shared between the two. So often I refer to implantation failure and miscarriage as different faces of the same coin. And what I'm going to present you tonight um, applies predominantly to blastocyst implantation. But I would like to um, make it absolutely clear from the very beginning that some of the factors that affect blastocyst implantation can also be found uh, as causes of early pregnancy loss. So if you're listening tonight and uh, you have had unsuccessful um, uh, embryo transfers or unfortunately you have suffered 
uh, early miscarriages, then you may be looking into some factors that could be shared between the two. So when we look at uh, what to investigate and why to investigate, what to investigate, normally we'll be looking at ovarian reserve, we'll be looking at uh, semen performance or semen analysis, we'll be looking at uh, um, uh, the normal appearance of the uterus, normal appearance of the ovaries, and uh, uh, we'll also be looking, and you have had a number of seminars or webinars, perhaps called these days, on uh, um, investigating embryo quality, and that being both morphological as well as genetic. But what I would like to argue tonight is the fact that uh, investigating the uterus uh, is as important as investigating everything else we do before commencing a uh, cycle of assisted conception. In my practice and uh, 20 years of experience, I like to individualize the uh, diagnostic test we offer to, to my patients with a um, plan to minimize any unnecessary treatments, uh, minimize the time to pregnancy, and maximize the chance of success in the shortest possible time scale. So how do we define and explain, and how do we explain recurrent failure? We often <clears throat> are confronted with the dilemma of something being unexplained that could be unexplained subfertility, unexplained implantation failure, unexplained um, miscarriage. But we need to be in a position to explain, if possible, why subfertility occurs, why embryo transfer fails, and why a miscarriage occurs. And the only way to explain it is by looking into the possible causes. We have learned a lot in the field, given that uh, we have made significant progress in investigating morphologically and genetically the embryos from stage um, of uh, very early stage, so cleavage embryo, so that is day two or day three, to blastocyst day five, day six. We know what embryos should look like, we know what blastocysts should look like, and we have the ability and the technology to test embryos and blastocysts and determine whether they are genetically normal or not. And that per se has been seen as an improvement in, uh, in, in, in the field of um, assisted conception. And data published in the literature demonstrate that uh, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidies of embryos increases the chances of a live birth, reduces the risk of miscarriage. So tonight, I'm going to talk on the importance of investigating the endometrium, investigating the uterus, because sometimes it is just assumed that everything is fine. And embarking on IVF as a first option, first strategy, doesn't always overcome the underlying fertility problem. I do not believe, I do not agree, I do not share the view that everything that is not successful is unexplained. And uh, within uh, my clinic, we always endeavor to investigate the uterus at a very early stage of the uh, uh, fertility program to ensure that we can shorten the time to pregnancy, we can reduce the risk of miscarriages, we can increase the chances of successful blastocyst implantation. So I'm going to start sharing with you some of the gynecological problems known to impact on normal endometrial environment that will in turn affect the ability of embryos to implant. So the first and one of the commonest gynecological problems encountered in women trying to conceive is the presence of fibroids. Uh, 
Fibroids are generally, in uh, more than 99% of cases, benign lumps that can go within the uterus, in the layers of the uterus, and outside the uterus. Clearly, the impact on fertility and implantation is significantly different if the fibroid is on the outside or is on the inside. And different theories have been presented to explain why fibroids can cause subfertility, why fibroids can cause miscarriage. Later on in pregnancy, fibroids can cause other complications, including preterm delivery and uh, the need for a cesarean section because of malpresentation. But in early pregnancy, fibroids are a cause of, of miscarriage. And in women trying to conceive, fibroids are a cause of subfertility. You can see that fibroids can uh, impact on tubal patency. Fibroids can be a foreign body within the uterus, not dissimilar from a coil. Fibroids can impact on normal endometrial activity, inducing contractions and can also cause abnormal blood supply to the uterus and inflammation. These are the fibroids that are normally located within the uterus and in the layers of the uterus close to the endometrium. Will not apply to fibroids that are away from the endometrium and that are outside the uterus. So here are some photographs of fibroids that I have come across in my career from uh, very small fibroids within the uterus. You can see they're up in the middle, the first um, row, the, the, the photograph in the middle, to very large fibroids with multiple, multiple fibroids in the uterus that are, are obviously not just a cause of subfertility, but a significant a cause of significant pelvic pain, as well as heavy periods, painful periods, painful intercourse, and in some cases, also bowel problems and bladder problems. But keeping the focus on to fertility, I can reassure you that it is known that fibroids within the uterus and fibroids within the layers of the uterus will affect normal fertility performance. So according to the European Society of Gynae Endoscopy, Fibroids that are present within the uterus, so inside the endometrial environment, are called submucous fibroids. And these are the fibroids that we'll be looking to remove in women trying to conceive, not after having had a failed IVF cycle, not after having had a miscarriage, but proactively before trying to conceive. And I have had many patients waiting to start fertility treatment that have had surgery to remove some mucus fibroids and conceived naturally without the need to start IVF treatment. So according to the classification, the fibroids are divided in type zero, type one and type two, depending on how much of the fibroid protrudes within the endometrial cavity. So type zero is if the fibroid is completely within the endometrial cavity, Type 1, if it's uh, more than 50% of the sites of the fibroid. Type 2, if it's less than 50% of the fibroid. And these fibroids can easily be seen on a transvaginal, two-dimensional ultrasound scan. There is evidence that fibroids that are within the uterine cavity will affect the success of IVF. And uh, I wouldn't want to have my wife or my sister, as well as any of my patients that have a large or any size fibroid within the uterus to embark on IVF treatment. Because according to the published evidence, the chances of, su of successful outcome are very slim and definitely more likely to fail than to succeed. It is important also to look at fibroids that are not within the uterus 
but are within the layers of the uterus and may be close to the endometrium. And without getting or becoming too technical, what I look at and what evidence suggests is that we need to look for the presence of fibroids that impact or are close to the junctional zone. The junctional zone is the area between the endometrium and the myometrium. So there is evidence that fibroids that are affecting or impinging the junctional zone should be removed in order to give the uterus the best chance of success. And the reason being that fibroids close to the junctional zone, although not directly within the cavity of the uterus, will cause inflammation, will affect blood supply, and will induce contractions. The best way to assess if fibroids are impacting or impinging on the junctional zone will be by MRI scan. But admittedly, this day and age with a high definition, good quality ultrasound scan machines we have in our consulting rooms, the use of MRI scan has become not completely out of fashion, but has become not as frequent. How do we manage then fibroids? If the fibroids are within the uterus, and those are called submucosal fibroids, that being type 1, type 2, or type 0, they should be removed. If they are close to the junctional zone, they should also be removed. If instead they are not close to the junctional zone, they are on the outside of the uterus, they are called subserosal fibroids, and there is no need to remove the fibroids. The other topic is polyps. Polyps are, again, very common, mostly benign, can be the result of a prolonged hormone treatment. And in most cases, there is no specific reason why fibro uh, polyps grow. And, and there is sometimes an ultras on ultrasound scan a differential diagnosis to be made between fibroids and polyps. Generally, polyps are soft and fleshy and are very easy to remove by hysteroscopy. Can affect implantation because they are considered to be foreign bodies within the uterus, can cause spotting and bleeding and impact on the ability of a blastocyst to implant successfully. Sometimes polyps can be very, very large and occupy a significant area within the endometrium. Again, polyps should be removed before a woman is trying to conceive, before starting IVF treatment, or if there is a history of miscarriages. What about adhesions? Adhesions are another cause of subfertility, are a cause of uh, miscarriage, are a cause of implantation failure. Adhesions normally form from previous surgery, so it's very, very important taking a good history. Previous miscarriages, DNC procedures, insertion of coils, previous sexually transmitted diseases, they all cause intrauterine adhesions. It is an increasingly frequent diagnosis because it can be seen on ultrasound scan as some very bright white, we call them technically hyper echoic areas within the uterus, within the endometrium, can be associated with pain can be associated with light periods, can be associated with painful periods, can cause subfertility and miscarriage. If the gynecologist or the fertility physician believes that a patient may have intrauterine adhesions, then a simple diagnostic hysteroscopy can be performed and the appearance will be 
what you see now on the screen. And treatment sometimes is challenging. And the worst case scenario of intrauterine adhesions is a syndrome called Asherman syndrome, where there is no space within the uterus for um, the telescope to be inserted in. There is a, a complete obliteration of the inside of the uterus by what looks like cotton wool. And uh, that surgery is challenging, can only be performed by experienced surgeons and uh, is, in my experience, a procedure that can be successful and is a procedure that is combined with um, the insertion of a coil to reduce the risk of additions forming again and uh, um, with at least eight weeks of hormone therapy to induce uh, a rapid and uh, significant growth of the lining of the womb. There is some evidence to suggest that the removal of adhesions improves fertility, improves the ability of an embryo to implant. The pregnancy rate after hysteroscopic removal of adhesions can be as high as 30%. However, there might be problems with placental insertion, which in turn, in turn will cause problems during pregnancy with the baby not growing very well, or some bleeding, or sometimes the placenta inserting too deep into the layers of the uterus. It is a, a reason for performing cesarean section can cause bleeding after delivery because the uterus may not be contracting very well. And as already said, can also be a cause of a growth restriction, which means the baby doesn't grow very well. So, so far I've presented three relatively common conditions in my practice, fibroids, polyps, and adhesions that can be easily diagnosed, all except perhaps the presence of severe adhesions inside the uterus easily treated, and sometimes are not diagnosed because no investigations are carried out. More recently, we have acquired information about how important is the endometrial environment. And uh, what we do in our clinic in uh, women with a history of recurrent implantation failure, when good quality embryos have been previously transferred, we recommend to do analysis of the endometrium, which is a genetic testing after taking a biopsy of the endometrium. It uses the latest genetic technology called NGS. And uh, is uh, easy to perform and gives us information about the best time when to transfer the embryo. So what we see is that uh, the biopsy is performed at a certain time in the cycle, as you will see shortly, and we will get information based on the analysis of some gene expression of the endometrium being in the pre-receptive phase, so means not ready yet, or in the receptive phase, which is what we want to see, or in the post-receptive phase, means as past the best, need, need to do it earlier. So the information we gain is very, very important. In order to personalize, the time of embryo transfer. And what happens in order to personalize the time of embryo transfer? In a mock cycle, which means mimicking what happens in a frozen embryo transfer cycle, either being a natural cycle or a hormonally controlled cycle, we would be performing 
in a hormonally controlled cycle, a biopsy after five days of progesterone, instead in a natural cycle, after seven days from LH surge. And what we see is whether there is an adequate endometrial environment to support successful blastocyst implantation. And very often in women that have had repeated implantation failure cycles, we will see the presence of an endometrium that is not yet prepared, in which case needs more progesterone exposure. There is some evidence and there is a, a publication to suggest that the non-receptive endometrium or the percentage of women that have subfertility and non-receptive endometrium increases with body weight. And possibly because increased body weight will induce peripheral production of steroids that will impact on endometrial development. So this is one of the reasons why maintaining a normal body weight, ideally less than 30, a BMI less than 30, which is still considered being overweight, gives the best endometrial environment and the best chance for an embryo to implant. You can see that once the BMI goes over 30, then there is more chance of having an abnormal endometrial environment and that increases up to over 40 percent in morbidly obese women associated with endometrial environment and what error the endometrial receptivity assessment test tells me is just when is the best time for transferring the embryo but associated with the error test is another test called ALICE. And uh, the interesting thing is that we know that the uterus, the vagina, have got a microbiome. They have their own bacterial environment. And uh, up to 30% of women embarking on IVF treatment have an abnormal environment, either being vaginal environment or endometrial environment. This is no different than the microbiome in the, in the bowel, but that is symptomatic with IBS, with cramps, with abdominal distension, with some pain, whereas the abnormal microbiome in the uterus is not symptomatic unless we take implantation failure as a symptom or perhaps a sign. So we need to be aware that an abnormal bacterial environment within the uterus is responsible for implantation failure. And you can see from this slide how bacterial vaginosis increases by fivefold the risk of late miscarriage, as well as by threefold, increase the risk of premature rupture of membranes, so preterm labor. And what we know that uh, the most important bacterial species within the endometrium is called lactobacillus. The lack of lactobacillus or the dominance of other types of bacteria will affect the chances of an embryo to implant successfully. You can see in this table, the two columns, one called LDM, which is the lactobacillus dominant microbiome, and NLDM is the non-lactobacillus dominant microbiome. And if you look at the live birth rate in the lactobacillus dominant microbiome, that is as high as 58%. Whereas in the non-lactobacillus 
dominant microbiome is as low as 6%. But what is astonishing is how, in cases of non-lactobacillus dominant environment, the miscarriage rate is as high as 60%, whereas in the lactobacillus dominant environment of microbiome is 16%. So we need to bear in mind that the endometrial environment and the presence of an adequate bacterial environment is important for IVF outcome, for pregnancy outcome, and also to reduce the risk of miscarriage. My next topic is the presence of uterine abnormalities. Uterine abnormalities are congenital, which means something that women are born with. There are various type of congenital uterine abnormalities. And the one I'm going to focus on is the presence of a septum. The septum is like a partition wall within the uterus, can be a full septum if occupies the entire cavity of the uterus, or a partial septum if occupies a per proportional percentage of the cavity. There is some evidence that a septate uterus being a full septum or a partial septum can impact on the ability of a blastocyst to implant and can cause miscarriage as well as cause preterm delivery and uh, the, an increased um, risk of, or perhaps a chance of cesarean section for fetal malpresentation. What we know is that uh, the presence of a septum will affect the implantation, will affect placentation, will uh, be cause of miscarriage because of uh, in increased contraction, um, will reduce the size of the uterine cavity, and will also impact on the presence of growth factors and growth factors receptors that are important for normal endometrial function. And briefly, there is evidence that removing the septum improves outcome. So what this study shows that um, in the group of women that had the septum and the septum was removed, the miscarriage rate is lower than in the overall general population, but the clinical pregnancy rate is comparable to the population of women that don't have a septum. So when comparing the exact number of women with the presence of an incomplete or partial septum versus women that were of same age, but without a septum, the clinical pregnancy rate after excision of septum was the same in the two groups. And uh, there is evidence that the presence of a septum affects subfertility or causes subfertility, can be responsible for what we think, or sometimes patients are told to be unexplained subfertility, but in fact, it's not unexplained. It's just it's not been investigated, it's not been found. And the removal of the septum by hysteroscopic surgery improves the chance of successful implantation. And if women have a septum, even IVF is not going to overcome the problem. So they will move from unexplained subfertility to unexplained implantation failure. And removal of the septum increases significantly the ability to achieve a successful pregnancy over a 12 month period naturally. And there has, there has been a, re, a, a relatively um, a recent publication showing that irrespective of the size of the septum, 
removing the septum gives a good chance of live birth. The chances of achieving a live birth has got a significant improvement after surgery with a tenfold increase. And that is something that we should be aware of. And if we do remove a septum and the patient needs to have IVF anyway, maybe for a male problem, maybe for block tubes, maybe because embryos have to be genetically tested, there is no evidence that embryo transfer should be delayed. As you can see here, the clinical pregnancy rate is very similar if the IVF ICSI embryo transfer cycle is done within nine weeks from the time of surgery or is done after 17 weeks from the time of surgery. Within our practice, we normally perform the surgery. We put a coil in some cases, depending on how long was the septum within the uterus. We give some estrogen to build up again the lining of the womb. And then uh, we uh, remove the coil and advise patients either to start conceiving naturally straight away or to start the IVF process. I thank you very much for the attention. I sincerely hope that uh, this brief presentation has uh, given you some more food for the thoughts and perhaps gave you the opportunity not to focus on unexplained subfertility, unexplained miscarriage, unexplained implantation failure, but making sure that different things, some underlying gynecological problems are looked at in order to improve the pregnancy outcome. So thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you so much for that presentation. A very detailed one and very informative. I'm sure many patients will find it useful. And as you know, this is now time for our Q&A session. And I believe you already can see there are plenty of questions ready, some of them quite long and detailed ones as well. So, Professor Nardo, are you simply ready for them? Yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Perfect. Let's go ahead with the very first question here. 35 years old, blastocyst with PGD, diagnosis implantation failure. I have had two biochemical pregnancies and many negative transfer. Test was Alice, Emma, and Ira uh, performed laparoscopy to remove hydrosalp things done. I'm going to have my fourth hysteroscopy in a few weeks. I have endometriosis, insulin resistance treated, and with preventive immune treatment. Any suggestion? This time the transfer will be in natural cycle. All transfers have been in a substituted cycle. One of the biochemical pregnancies was from natural pregnancy. Um, well, obviously, um, this, uh, um, this lady has had uh, a long uh, standing fertility problem. Uh, I'm not entirely sure um, whether um, the ERA test was performed because I cannot see here as being done. I understand. Okay, just say the test, test ERA, at least it was done. Okay, yes. so all the tests exactly. were done. So I assume all came back as negative. Uh, there is uh, evidence that hydrosalpings can affect the endometrial environment. So if any of the embryo transfers and the pregnancies occurred while there was still an hydrosalping, that could be a contributing factor. If the hysteroscopies have shown that uh, the uterus is normal, again, that is uh, nothing to do with abnormalities. What is interesting is the presence of endometriosis. Endometriosis has been considered as a, a cause of a abnormal endometrial environment. Um, some years ago, myself and colleagues in, uh, in uh, America published a number of papers showing that women with endometriosis have a delayed endometrium. And normally in my practice, what we do, we don't do a natural cycle in women with endometriosis. We do prolonged down regulation. So we suppress the pituitary um, gland. We stop the cycles completely for three months. 
before restarting the endometrial activity with the high doses of estrogen and then progesterone. So what we like to do, according to the evidence uh, that we published, is to actually reset the endometrial clock in women with endometriosis, because the endometrium in women with endometriosis is likely to be disorganized. So although a biopsy can show to be in phase because of just progesterone exposure, but deep the endometrium may not be ready for the pregnancy. So my recommendation will be not to do a natural cycle, but instead to downregulate the pituitary gland to stop the cycles and then restart on a hormonally controlled cycle. Perfect. Thank you so much for that recommendation. And the next question is up here as well. When preparing the endometrium, does the dosage of progesterone matter? For example, if you give someone 600 milligrams versus 800 pessaries, or if you add in SC injections as well, if the test result comes back pre-receptive, is it only a matter of not enough time exposed to progesterone, or is it possible that the P4 dosage may have also been too low and or the body is not absorbing it efficiently? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. This is a very good question. Um, it is still unknown, but what we know as a, as a fact that takes time for the endometrium to absorb progesterone. So for the same reason, could you achieve what you achieve normally in five days by giving the same dose of progesterone in one day? Well, the answer is no. So there is a ceiling effect with receptors in the uterus. And there is evidence that uh, prolonged progesterone administration may be better than uh, high doses of progesterone within a short uh, period of time, because the receptors for the progesterone may not be able to uh, respond to the doses of progesterone as well as if progesterone is um, given over a, a longer period of time. I have had cases where women that have had an endometrial biopsy for the endometrial receptivity assay, so to determine the implantation window, after five days of progesterone, and the endometrium was still pre-receptive, which means they need another day of progesterone, or another half day, or another day and a half. And you cannot overcome that by giving a higher dose in the five previous days. So I think 800 milligram progesterone that in the form of pessaries, for instance, 400 milligram pessaries twice a day is a good standard dose, but the length of the progesterone administration may differ. Perfect. Once again, thank you so much for uh, this question as well as your advice, your answer to this. Um, next question is, how would you test the levels of bacteria if this test is not available? Um, well, you can't. The test is available in our clinic, but if you, the test is not available in a specific clinic, then obviously you cannot test it. So normally it's done by taking a biopsy of the lining of the room called endometrium at a specific time and the biopsy is sent to the lab and then uh, they will be looking for the presence of uh, um, bacteria, uh, confirming that the lactobacillus is the main bacteria within the endometrial cavity, or if there are other types of bacteria, then perhaps consider other antibiotics or probiotics. What we need to know is whether perhaps there are cases of bacteria within the uterus that cause chronic endometritis, which is inflammation within the uterus that will affect embryo implantation. So the test has to be done in order to determine the presence of bacteria. Otherwise, it will be a silent problem. All right. And next question is right here as well. You talked about the vaginal bacterial environment. How can this be tested? Yeah, this is the same. Um, it can be tested by a biopsy and there is treatment. Treatment is normally with probiotics or antibiotics, which is normally recommended based on the test results. And then obviously a second biopsy is needed to ensure that the normal endometrial environment has been restored. 
All right, perfect. Thank you so much for clarifying that one. Next question, again, a bit longer one. Here's Here it is. I had a 9 centimeter broad alignment subserosal plus 3 centimeter spindle subserosal fibroid, which have been removed laparoscopically uh, last year. Prior to surgery, I miscarried at first time at 7 weeks and second time missed miscarriage at 12 weeks. Heartbeat detected at 8 weeks. Would the fibers been a cause of my miscarriages? I did all the recurrent miscarriage at and everything came back normal. Also, I have been trying to conceive since August 2019, but only one biochemical pregnancy. Should I start IVF? I am 38 and time is not on my side. Um, Prima, this is a, a, a very frustrating and indeed um, uh, confusing and perhaps challenging for the physicians looking after it. But um, as, a, as I mentioned in my presentation, if the fibroid were affecting the junction of the zone, they could cause abnormal contractions, abnormal vascularity. I have no information about the ultrasound findings or indeed the operation notes in relation to your surgery. So it is difficult for me to say whether actually that was a cause of your previous miscarriages or not but could potentially have been a cause of your miscarriages. You also need to bear in mind that uh, women of your chronological age have probably 70%, 75% chances of producing abnormal embryos. And uh, that per se is another contributing factor to miscarriage. So I think um, at this point in time it's difficult and I wouldn't worry about what was the cause of your previous miscarriages if you haven't got any more fibroids. And instead, I would embark on IVF with a plan to create embryos that can be cultured to blastocysts and be genetically tested. Because on balance of probabilities and based on published evidence, there is more chance than not that uh, your embryos are genetically abnormal just because of your age which in turn will be cause of miscarriage or implantation failure. All right. Thank you so much once again for that advice and your recommendations as well. Next question is right here. Can laparoscopic myomectomy cause your tubes to get blocked? Any, any surgery, especially laparoscopic myomectomy or open myomectomy can cause uh, adhesions within the uterus, uh, within the uterus, so within the pelvis. And if the adhesions are within the pelvis, it is possible that cause um, tubal blockage or may not be tubal blockage, so the tubes are open, but abnormal tubal function. So anyone that has had surgery is at increased risk of adhesions. Hence why before offering surgery for any problem we need to look at what are the consequences the complications of surgery for somebody trying to conceive i do perform surgery regularly from laparoscopic myomectomy to laparoscopic hysterectomies to tubal surgery to ovarian cyst to removal of adhesions or removal of endometriosis and i always consent my patients as one of the possible consequences and the risks of surgery, the presence of adhesions. And adhesions in women seeking pregnancy, in women that have got tubes and are planning to conceive naturally, could cause blocked. A blockage could also cause abnormal uh, tubal function. So the tubes are not blocked, but are not contracting, are not functioning properly because adhesions may stretch or alter the normal anatomy and the relationship with the ovaries. All right. Again, thank you so much for that clarification. Um, and next question is right here. So what are the tests or ultrasound I do in my country to ensure a successful implementation I had two ectopic pregnancies before? Well, I, I'm not entirely sure and which one is your country, um, but Implantation is a, is, is a problem, obviously, and uh, maybe again that there is a fine line or the same underlying problem between uh, failed implantation and uh, ectopic pregnancies. 
Okay, you're in France. So France is a, a country where um, the technology is available. Uh, you can have, I would suggest that you have a, a, a hysteroscopy um, to look at the uterus, look at the inside of the uterus to exclude some abnormalities. And also, if you have a two ectopic pregnancies, you will need to be seen by a gynecologist with uh, expertise in reproductive surgery and possibly a fertility physician as well to see if there are underlying causes of for your ectopic pregnancy. Sometimes could be adhesions, sometimes could be damaged tubes. Um, and in some cases, it is necessary to remove the tubes to reduce the risk of uh, other ectopic pregnancies in case obviously the tubes have not been removed already. But if you are attempting to conceive and uh, you have, you, know, you say you've already had an HSG, that is to check tubal patency, but doesn't tell me if the tubes function. But you will need to consider having a hysteroscopy in order to assess the inside of the uterus. And if you were to embark on IVF treatment and you have had ectopic pregnancies, um, I would probably consider clipping the tubes and uh, um, do IVF in order to reduce the risk of um, damage. I know you say tube is blocked, but that's the problem. If the tube is blocked, you can have fluid um, accumulating within the uterus and the fluid within the uterus becomes toxic. And that is the reason why embryos may not implant or that's the reason why you can have an ectopic pregnancy. So blocked tubes in my opinion, and current evidence suggests that should be removed, should be detached at least from the uterus before embarking on IVF treatment. That's what we do in my clinic all the time. Excellent. Thank you again for answering this uh, question. Uh, there are plenty of questions coming up, so let's go to the next one. I had a laparoscopic surgery with a myomectomy. The fiber was in the wall of my uterus. My doctor says to not to do a transfer for at least three months. Why is the wait so long when the embryo isn't very large at first? Again, it's very difficult because I don't have any information about the, the, the fibroid. How close was the fibroid to the endometrium? Um, and... Uh, whether it was an impact on blood supply, the, the sites itself, the fiber, lots of factors. Um, a laparoscopic myomectomy normally improves the endometrial performance. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I, was, I say it was near the car. I'm not entirely sure about the reason why he said to wait for three months. It is certainly, there is certainly no evidence and not uh, advised or um, published um, uh, recommendation to say you have to wait for a certain number of months, provided that there is a normal endometrial environment. So provided four weeks after the surgery, the endometrium looks good, homogeneous, thickened, there's no free fluid within the cavity, then you don't need to wait. Some surgeons may be anxious about the fact that you have had a myomectomy and, and that is because of the risk of a uterine rupture. But realistically, the uterus doesn't rupture when you are three months pregnant. The uterus ruptures when you are nine months pregnant, when you are 38 weeks pregnant. And before then, would be a long way. So in my practice, I normally perform the myomectomy I normally perform a scan for weeks after the myomectomy. If the endometrium looks good and there are no um, problems within the cavity, then uh, I would advise others to start trying to conceive naturally or indeed to have an embryo transfer. All right. Thank you again for your um, advice on that as well. Next question. Right here, can intramural, posterior, and subserosal fibers prevent one from receiving IVF success? Also, can it cause miscarriage? Yeah, as, as mentioned already, depending on the sites, depending on whether they are close to the junction zone, can cause abnormal contraction, can cause inflammation, can cause um, abnormal blood supply. 
However, the definition of subsiloso, which means on the outside of the uterus, intramural, which is in, in the middle layer of the uterus, or submucus, which are on the inside of the uterus, is very much operator dependent. So what may be a intramural fibroid for a gynecologist that may be not very familiar, doesn't see that every day in his practice, could be a submucus type two fibroid for somebody else. So you can see that the definition of the site of fibroid may vary between different gynecologists and indeed the surgical approach, the recommendation and the consequences of the fibroid on future pregnancy outcome, they are dependent on the presence of the fibroid as well as the site and the sites of the fibroid. Okay, thank you so much again for answering this question. Um, next question is up right here. Hi, I had three embryo transfers using donor embryos. Everything up to transfer was fine, yet no sign of pregnancy. I have had fibroids removed between second and third go, 18 in total and up to 8 centimeters. They were within the myometrium and I had been told they shouldn't have been an issue. I also had a cystectomy prior to starting IVF and I am 44 now and have a BMI of over 30. What tests should I explore? now well I, I don't know i find difficult that you've been told that if you had 18 fibroids uh, those were not affecting the uterus because the fibroids would have been within the uterus or within the layers of the uterus would have certainly affected the contractions so the normal uterine activity contractility would affect the blood supply so the fibroids per se would have been a cause of your subfertility. Um, what to do now, um, I think is for you to have a diagnostic hysteroscopy um, to ensure that the removal of fibroids hasn't caused any adhesions within the uterus. Because that is a possibility, that is a consequence. Yeah, you say there were four and surgery found 18. Um, sometimes, again, it's very much operator dependent. You, it's difficult to say that the scan shows four fibroids and then you go and operate and remove 18. So it's not actually four and five. So perhaps the initial scan wasn't showing very much accurate, accurate information. But anyway, that is gone. That is done. You've got no fibroids now. You're 44, which is age per se is a problem. You have raised BMI, which again uh, is an issue. Uh, you've used donor eggs, um, I assume, or perhaps donor embryos uh, altogether. Anyway, I think what you need to do now, you need to have a, a diagnostic hysteroscopy to assess the endometrial cavity to exclude the presence of any um, additions. And then if that is normal, I would recommend you have the endometrial combined test, which includes the ERA, so the endometrial receptivity assessment, and then also the test for uh, um, bacterial infection and the test for chronic endometritis. The bacterial in in is, uh, infection is called EMMA, e -M -M -A, and the test to exclude chronic endometritis, endometritis is called ALICE. So, hysteroscopy first and then endometrial combined test. Okay, perfect. Once again, thank you so much for your recommendations. And uh, well, there's another question, quite a longer one. Here it is. Hello, I'm 41. I have three myomas, one around four centimeters transmural with endometrium contact and two more with 15 millimeters and 19 millimeters. This intramural does touch the endometrium, was operated for adhesions and suffer as well of adenomyosis. Would you advise me to perform treatment before start all process? And after this, we will, will my chances uh, go quite minimum? of implantation due to the several issues in the uterus? Uh, well, of course, you have got a number of issues in the uterus. So you've got fibroids. Um, 
as say my presentation, you do need to have the fibroids that are close to the end uterus removed. There is a risk of you forming adhesions both within the uterus and outside the uterus, but it's a matter of balancing the risk of you forming adhesions and the risk of you not getting pregnant because of the fibroids. So the surgery has to be performed by a skilled and a, a experienced uh, surgeon, possibly a fertility surgeon, not just a gynecologist. And uh, I would advise that after the surgery, perhaps you take some estrogen in order to build up the lining of the womb and avoid forming additions within the cavity. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much once again for that. Um, let me just have a look. Uh, okay, no, it's the next question. Just wanted to see if we have any additional information, but uh, let's go to the next question here. You mentioned that your clinic prefers to do lo protocol and downregulate for longer, but if patient had a low AMH and low ovarian reserve, is it still appropriate to downregulate? My consultant queries why my first clinic chose to downregulate. As he said, I have low ovarian reserve, so best not to bring on premenopause state. Okay, Belinda, this is different. So we are talking about two different things. One is the protocol to stimulate the ovaries. So I agree that if you have low AMH and low ovarian reserve, you will be much better on a short protocol. But you can have a short protocol to create embryos, so to stimulate the ovaries, collect eggs, fertilize the eggs, create embryos, which can, which can be frozen. And then in the frozen embryo transfer cycle, you can be down-regulated because the embryos have already been created. So there is no impact on ovarian reserve. And in that case, down-regulation, if you have a history of endometriosis, will be, in my preference, the best option. Perfect. Thank you once again for your advice. And uh, let me have a look. Uh... Yes, excellent. Thank you. This is the comment from Linda. Uh, Linda, sorry. And the next question is uh, coming up here. I have a c seven centimeter subserosal intramural fiber at my clinic. Advice to not touch it as it is, has no effect on cavity. What do you recommend to get it removed or not? I'm also thinking to, to get hysteroscopy and laparoscopy done as I did not do that yet. I have one failed transfer and I am waiting for my next transfer. I have three embryos frozen. I'm 39. Um, well, as I said in my presentation, depends on is the presence of a subcerosal intramural or submucous fibroid is very, very much an individual diagnosis. Depends on the surgeon, depends on uh, um, the person who does the scan. And I think the question here is the fibroid is very big, seven centimeters is a large fibroid. Is that fibroid, if intramural, close to the endometrium? Does that fibroid impinge on the junctional zone? If it does, yes, you need to have it removed. Performing a hysteroscopy or laparoscopy at this stage may not be the best approach because if the fibroid is not submucosal, you may not be able to see it by hysteroscopy and laparoscopy will only confirm where the fibroid is. Will be more appropriate either to do a 3D ultrasound scan or arranging an MRI scan of the pelvis to see where the fibroid is in relation to the junctional zone, which would be my preference, or assuming that is close to the junctional zone and remove it because of the sites before your next transfer. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much again. Next question is, which day of the cycle should be the bacterial test be done, the biopsy? We normally do the bacterial uh, analysis, um, uh, the biopsy, together with the endometrial assessment, endometrial receptivity um, uh, analysis, um, uh, around day 20 of the cycle. That is during the implantation window. Okay. Excellent. Thank you once again. And next question is, would you suggest no harm to add L-acidophilus to your diet through probiotic yogurts, for example? Yeah, there's no harm in doing it at all. There's no harm. You don't know whether that probiotic treatment is what you need uh, in order to increase your lactobacillus. 
Perfect. Understood. Thank you so much once again. And next question is here. Is it possible to diagnose chlamydia or any other uterus infection through testing menstrual blood? Well, obviously, you can. You, uh, the best way will be to um, test for chlamydia and other sexually transmitted diseases through some swabs taken from within the cervical canal and within the vagina. Uh, chlamydia can also be diagnosed on a urine sample, which is a quite reliable test by a technique called PCR. All right, thank you once again. And actually now we have a bit of a longer question, which is, uh, there are two parts of it, okay? So, so let me show the first one. I was able to get pregnant via IVF donated egg last year, but unfortunately this ended in stillbirth in December 2019. Now we have had two embryo transfers, but no pregnancy. What tests should I perhaps have done? Originally I have had hysteroscopy where one polyp was removed in 2017. Tubes were not investigated as I was about to have IVF and doctors said the tubes wouldn't be needed therefore and thus no investigation of them. Overall I have had 11 transfers although probably only two embryos have been of very good quality. No other pregnancies. And next part of that is here. Addition, the hysteroscopy in 2017 showed there were no other polyps and the view to you the tubes was clear in 2017, but they didn't check whether the tubes were we were were open. Seeing my doctor next week to decide whether we have embryo transfer this cycle or farther tests. I am using both own eggs and donated eggs. ERA has been done. If you have had just the endometrial receptivity assessment test, then I would recommend that you also have now the ALICE and the EMMA test to exclude chronic endometritis and exclude any bacterial um, uh, abnormalities within the endometrium because they can be a cause of implantation failure. They can also be a cause of uh, um, problems throughout pregnancy, as I presented during my um, sh very short lecture. So you have been exposed to pregnancy. You were very unfortunate when you had the stillbirth in December 2019. That could have just been bad luck. Um, I understand that uh, the hysteroscopy was performed in 2017, which showed um, everything was fine and the polyp was removed. But I, again, would recommend perhaps another hysteroscopy just to make sure that uh, um, there have not been any adhesions or abnormalities within the uterus that could have occurred since then and then uh, if that's obviously is, is, is normal then the endometrial assessment to exclude bacterial vaginosis to exclude uh, abnormal bacterial environment exclude chronic endometritis and if all that is negative then yes you could carry on with another embryo transfer but perhaps have the embryos genetically tested Okay, thank you so much for your recommendation. And actually, there is a follow-up, okay? If you could answer which day of the cycle Alice and Emma test should be done. Yeah, ideally, as I say, it should be done during the implantation window. We normally do them around day 20 of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And one more, actually, which day of cycle the hysteroscopy should be done then? The hysteroscopy should be done at the beginning of the menstrual cycle, so just after the menstruation is finished. So... If you do it too late in the cycle, it may not be easy to see the uh, um, abnormalities. You may not be able to see if there is some adenomyosis. You may not be able to see um, if there are um, uh, some uh, patches of abnormal endometrial development because the thick endometrium may obscure the normal um, uh, view of of the uterus as shown at the time of hysteroscopy. So I would recommend that it's done um, straight uh, after uh, the uh, menstruation has ended. And can you do it while you're on estrogen? Yes, you can do it while you're on estrogen, but if you've got a very thick endometrium because of estrogen, I would suggest not to do it. Excellent. Thank you so much for answering all those additional questions as well to this patient. And uh, there are Okay, uh, sorry, there was one more thing. Uh, that doesn't matter if it's day 10 or day 5 or day 20. If you have got a thick endometrium more than 6, 7 millimeters, even if you're on day 10, I would uh, induce a bleed. You have a period, bleed, and then do it afterwards. 
Excellent. And actually, there's additional question for from a different patient. Can you do a hysteroscopy during the same time as the egg collection? Yes, of course, you can do the hysteroscopy at the same time as the collection. We do that very frequently. And because we like to freeze embryos, uh, obviously, after genetic testing, and we do several cycles in our clinic where we don't do fresh embryo transfers. We collect eggs, fertilize them, do genetic testing, freeze the embryos. Meanwhile, we investigate the uterus and often we do the hysteroscopy at the same time as a collection. But not many clinics do it because uh, you need to have special equipment to do a hysteroscopy as it's a gynecological procedure. So um, in, uh, uh, in the uh, part of England where my clinic is based, um, I am aware that other private fertility clinics do not perform the hysteroscopy because they do not have the facilities to perform that, that, that procedure. But in theory, yes, it can be performed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, uh, well, sorry, there is an additional around this topic, so just let me go uh, to this one. Alice and Emma, are they done when, sorry, when they are... <laughs> on estrogen the progesterone as, as in transfer yeah you can do them on a natural cycle or you can do on a hormonally controlled cycle if you're planning to have a frozen embryo transfer on an hormonally controlled cycles with estrogen progesterone then i would suggest yes it would be better to do it while you're on estrogen progesterone excellent thank you and there's one more actually so what is the benefit of hysteroscopy during egg collection as compared to end of cycle uh, well, you only have one sedation for the procedure. Uh, you only uh, have, obviously, one um, hospital admission. Um, and uh, you can uh, assess the endometrium. And obviously, you're not going to do an embryo transfer. So uh, you combine the benefit of the collection with that of endometrial assessment. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much once again. And well, there's an additional question from the very same patient again, so let me go to that. If I did not respond to the Pergoveris treatment, do you think the egg collection during the natural cycle is an advantage? Uh, obviously, this is out of the scope of tonight's webinar. Um, I, I do not believe in a natural cycle IVF. Uh, I think that uh, um, IVF per se has to be done with ovarian simulation. Um, there has been lots of, um, I would say, uh, publicity around some clinics offering natural cycle IVF. It's not what I do. I like to personalize the stimulation protocol. And uh, Pergoveris is one of many medications we can use to induce ovarian stimulation. It's not the only one. So I would not recommend natural cycle. I would look at what everything you have had and what can be done different in the subsequent cycle. But of course, if you have very low ovarian reserve, if you have very low AMH, if you only have few antral follicles, then it might be that there is very little that can be done in order to induce ovarian stimulation. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Once again, there are like five questions left, so we will be slowly finishing. So this will be like a final call for those questions. So if you have any left, go ahead and type them in. And now let's go to the question from Belinda. We are about to go for our fourth ICSI cycle. Last cycle was farthest we got stay five transfer, not quite a blastocyst. Thinking should we go for ERA test or PGS, DNA fragmentation test, NK cell test, endometrial scratch. If costs are an issue, would you pro prioritize one over another? What's the, your view on using meds such as metformin or Klexon to help implantation? Well, Belinda, it looks like the problem was in creating embryos or perhaps in embryo quality. So looking at the um, endometrium and looking at uh, uh, you know, what is uh, the presence of NK cells or even endometrial scratch, perhaps it's not relevant because we assume that there might be a problem with the endometrium if you have had good quality embryos transferred before. I would recommend pre-implantation genetic testing and if you have had uh, uh, poor fertilization or poor embryo formation, then I would recommend also sperm DNA fragmentation test. There is an indication, there is a benefit of using metformin if there is a um, 
polycystic ovaries. I would also recommend that uh, um, Clexane is an adjuvant and should only be prescribed, should only be used uh, in certain uh, conditions, in certain cases. We are not going to have metformin and Clexane to overcome problems with embryo quality. Can only overcome problems with implantation. But again, you need to have a good quality embryo before you assume that there is a problem with the endometrium. Understood. Thank you so much again for that explanation. And next question is um, right here. Sorry. I am 49. I have two fight implantation using Sorex with PGT embryos. Was treated for adenomyosis with Lucrin for three months. Had laparoscopy for fibroids. All other tests were good. HSG test ruled out fluid in the tubes, even though they are blocked. I'm due for my next cycle. Era not done. What other things can I do now considering my age? The previous transfer have been very painful and the new doctor says she will put me under for this transfer. Thank you. Okay, I would definitely I would definitely recommend that you have the ERA test to assess the implantation window. I would also do a test to check for the presence of any ab abnormal bacterial environment, as well as uh, excluding uh, chronic endometritis. I think that is certainly important. Because you have had the laparoscopy for the fibroids, it is possible that you got some adhesions within the uterus. So I would also recommend to do a hysteroscopy because the HSG doesn't rule out the presence of adhesions within the uterus. Excellent. Once more, thank you so much. Next question right here. The IVF clinic, I have had a mini consultation suggested I do PGS testing on my embryos as I have had recurrent miscarriages. Anything you can I, advise? I, I, I agree. I agree. It's, it's, a good, it's a good option. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Um, next question, a bit longer one, but this is, we have like two, three questions left. So, hello, finally, after 10 IVS with my own eggs, as well as donor eggs, miscarriages, etc., I will be using a donor and surrogate, but my question is for my own health. I have intramural and subserial serous of fibroids taken out twice, endometriosis all my life and other problems. Should I be worried for my own future health and should I be doing anything to generally be healthy? My BMI is 19.520. I eat a Mediterranean orga organic diet. I have organic probiotics, 18, eight, sorry, 80 billion, 34 strains every day, organic flax, seed oil as well, etc. So anything yeah, you can advise no i think angela no you should not be concerned about it provided you've got no other symptoms i think um as i said before endometriosis is a, a chronic condition um and you will have it for most of your life or at least a reproductive life um i think you should just uh um live the life you live now be um, healthy you've got normal body mass index you've got normal healthy diet you take probiotics so i wouldn't recommend to do anything Excellent. We understood perfectly as well. Thank you. And uh, there are like few questions left. So those are shorter ones. Can you assess microbiota tests with period blood? Will that permit to see the overall state of the uterus? No, no. Ideally, you don't want to test with uh, the, the endometrial microbiome with, uh, um, with menstrual, menstrual flow. You would like to test and the endometrium itself so that means the biopsy has to be taken when there is no poa mm -hmm. okay thanks so much and next question does an hcg injection the day of transfer improve implantation rates or is this still not proven there is no there is no um, evidence that the uh, hcg injection after the transfer improves implantation there, there have been some very um weak and uh, not controlled studies suggesting may improve in some types of patients with some um, previous with some types of um, stimulation protocols but and um, i cannot recommend that you should have acg injection on the day of transfer in order to improve implantation perfect thank you so much once again and actually another question is just for clarification okay where's your clinic in the uk do you do alice and emma test there so yes, we do Alice and Emma test. Uh, our clinic is in Cheshire, which is uh, um, South Manchester, uh, about 10, 15 um, minutes 
than Manchester, but um, between uh, Manchester, Liverpool, and Chester. And if you go onto our website, you can find the exact location of our uh, fertility and gynecology clinic. Excellent. Thank you so much for that clarification. And like there are two questions left, so let's get to them. Before my eighth IVF, for which I prepared about one year, I did PGS, DNA, NK cell test, genetic test, for which were collected two eggs of AA and AB quality. A few months before that, I did also halaparoscopy when the tubes were clipped and hysteroscopy. The, the implantation did not occur. What do you think went wrong? Um. Well, I think um, looking at this, also looks like um, I assume the embryos were genetically tested and came back as normal. And um, I'm not entirely sure whether there was any test done on the microbiome or to exclude the presence of an abnormal endometrial environment. Yeah, they were genetically tested. So. Um, Hysteroscopy and laparoscopy, they don't give us information about uh, endometritis. They don't give us information about abnormal endometrial environment. Especially if you had to have a laparoscopy to block the tubes or to clip the tubes because you had fluid, then it is likely that there was a problem with the endometrium because fluid in the endometrium from the tubes is toxic and can cause an abnormal endometrial environment. Perfect. Thank you so much and uh, there's a follow-up it was the second laparoscopy yeah that's fine it's still uh, it's still irrelevant it's because the fluid in the tube if you add fluid in the tube it can go back into the uterus and can affect endometrial performance and unfortunately that will stay for a long time unless treated all right thank you and there's a two-part question. Uh, I had hysteroscopy in December. Do you think the results are still valid now? And at the moment of hysteroscopy, I was having a lot in cycle, but not no menstruation for the last five months. Yeah, that could be a problem because it could affect normal endometrial environment. Is it also done in December? Yes, provided obviously the, the, the clear findings is still valid. Nothing would have changed since then, but if you have not been menstruating and having normal endometrial development, that itself is a factor that can impact on implantation potential. All right, thank you so much. And there are like two questions showed up, so uh, short ones, I hope we can still answer, right? <laughs> I already said that we will be finishing, right? So uh, just let me know. Um, yeah. Okay, what do you think about gonapeptil to aid implantation? Well, there is no evidence. I don't use it. I don't use um, that to help implantation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and well, now it looks like this is our last question that just popped out here. Uh, so what about new podium GSCSF to improve implantation? Anything you can say about that? Yeah, so there is uh, um, some growing evidence that uh, growth factors um, within the uterus improve implantation. I think this is still research and is not routinely performed in uh, um, clinical practice. Uh, I wouldn't recommend um, you or anyone else to have it until there is a robust evidence to suggest that it's effective and is safe. understood of course as well and as i mentioned it looks like this is our last question so thank you so much for all of your questions definitely detailed ones uh, and i'm sure it helped i mean professor nardo uh, that was uh, definitely excellent thank you so much for your expertise and all the details you have provided to all of our patients uh, there are some thank yous coming up here as you can see <laughs> brilliant session thank you so much Thanks so much. And uh, at the beginning, uh, there was also additional comment uh, from someone. Let me just find it. Just give me a second. So I just want you to see that. Um, uh, okay, sorry. So uh, thank you for the comprehensive and analytic presentation. You are absolutely great as always. Greetings from Greece. So just wanted you to see this as well. And uh, there are more good comments coming up anything you would like to add 
No, I, I, as usual, uh, as you know, Caroline, I'm very passionate about um, you know, what I do every day. So I think um, providing information to um, our patient population is important. Uh, I think fertility is a long and uh, emotional journey and uh, embarking on this journey with as much information as possible, I think it helps to cope with uh, unsuccessful stories, but equally um, helps to understand why sometimes the treatment doesn't work. So I really like the way um, you personally and uh, my IVF answers structure their um, uh, webinars because they provide that level of information that patients often cannot get out of one consultation. So this is very, very good. So thank you. And uh, thank you for all the very uh, positive and uh, um, uh, grateful uh, messages. And uh, I'm very happy to take any um, questions separately if any of our audience wants to email me my contact details are on the website so thank you very much indeed caroline and thank you to um, my IVF answers thank you so much for joining us and i know we will have another one so i'm really excited for that as well because uh, we definitely uh, i agree with all the patients right here <laughs> all the uh, this session has been amazing and uh, well thank you also to all of you for your very uh, positive comments, as Dr. Professor Leonardo said. And I just want to add that if you uh, would like to uh, share your comments or feedback, also get back to us. And if you have any suggestion with the topics, anything that we can help you out, remember that we are here for you and we are also here to listen and would love to receive some some uh, information from you if you would like to discuss anything. Once again, uh, thank you so much, Professor Nardo. It has been a pleasure. You. It's always a pleasure. And uh, well, have a lovely and restful evening. And I hope to see you also uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. UK time and at 8 p.m. UK time, you know, we will be here with some other topics uh, tomorrow. Actually, we will talk about surrogacy uh, in South Africa and US. So quite interesting as well. Hope you will be able to join us. And of course, this has been recorded. Therefore, once you follow us uh, on YouTube channel or Facebook or Instagram, you will be notified when this video is also uploaded. And that way you can simply um, be up to date with all of our events. Huge thanks once again. Have a lovely evening and good night. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank Bye, you. Caroline.